All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the 108th uh, management conference meeting here for the Veritarian Family and National Library Programs. We're glad to see everybody here today. Um, the way we do roll call now is we have you sign in. So if you have not signed in and you're here, even if you're visiting here as a guest, please make sure that you sign in before you leave so that we can uh, give you credit for being here. The minutes have gone out to everybody. And uh, you got any comments on the minutes from our last meeting? You might make a motion to accept them. Dwayne, thank you. Anybody second? Yes, sir. Thank you. All in favor? Uh, aye. All right. We all accept the minutes. So uh, for my remarks, what I'm going to do is turn the, the microphone over to Dr. Brian Roberts. Thank you, Quinn. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for all the work that went in over the last several months. Uh, as particularly, I want to thank Quentin and Jean and the helping uh, organize and run the search committee uh, for the director position. It was great to have so many members of the management conference that served on that search committee and participated in the process. And the staff uh, has been great uh, working with Donna and myself over the last several months. I want to thank them for all their efforts. Uh, you know, it's really impressive, this great group and organization and this larger management conference and how we can come together to try to make sure things keep moving along without missing a beat. And it's been really great to see that. Um, and I'm really happy to be able to say that I am not giving the director's report. And you'll have to hear me give one again because we're really uh, thrilled to have Brent Haas uh, step in as the director of BIDNA. With that, I'll turn it over to Brent. Well, thank you, Dr. Fontenot and uh, Roberts. Appreciate that warm welcome. Um, so I'm Brent, I'm the new guy. Uh, it's good to be here, uh, and while I am the new guy, certainly a bit now, it's, it's comforting, comforting for me to see so many familiar faces here and know that, uh, uh, and I hope that you all know that I'm not new to, of course, the issues that the estuary face uh, and some of the larger issues, of course, facing the state, certainly from the oil river patrol structure through the I-10 corridor and, uh, and points south. So good to be here, and I'm looking forward for uh, to getting to know those of you that I don't know. Uh, over the next weeks and months, and hopefully you get to know me uh, a little better as well. So it, it has been just a month. <clears throat> I'm new, as I said a minute ago. Uh, it's just a month here, but it's been an exciting month. It's been very, very good to interact with many of you, obviously to get to know uh, much better the, the dedicated and talented staff uh, that are part of the program, staff here with the program. Uh, really great, great bunch of folks, and I'm looking forward to working with them much, much more, obviously, uh, you know, as we move forward in the future. Uh, I've had an opportunity to speak with, I think, every former director, have some good discussions, multiple discussions with those guys as well. I've been able to get around, met with five of the 16 parish presidents so far that uh, our parishes that are part of the National Estuary, many of our partners uh, and potential past partners, potential partners in the form of, of NGOs. And I've gotten to talk with a, a number of you all. Uh, I've not been able to speak with all of you individually, but I want you to know that I do intend to do that. There's a lot of people in this room. It's going to take a while for that to happen. But uh, I'm very interested in hearing feedback from you all about your experiences with BitNet, uh, the things that, uh, of course, we do well here, uh, and the things maybe that we don't do well here that we can change or maybe improve upon. So very much uh, looking forward to having those discussions again over the next weeks and months. I, um, <clears throat> because I am new and I, and I don't know some of you all that well, before I kind of jump into the more traditional, I guess, director's report where I'm talking about the work that's been going on in the estuary over the last quarter, I did want to take an opportunity to just introduce myself a little bit, talk to you a little bit about my background, uh, my history, um, you know, what I hope to accomplish here at BitNet and kind of what my vision is looking, looking into the future. So I'll start off just by telling you that I am a Louisiana guy. I'm a lifelong Louisiana resident, born and raised uh, in Baton Rouge. I recognize that latter part is not necessarily a selling point in some circles, but uh, <laughs> but bear with me. My roots do run deep uh, in the estuary, and I uh, want to share a little bit with you about that. So, um, just some photos of, of me and, and family and friends. Uh, actually, this is all family uh, in the estuary. Some of this is a little bit difficult to see, but I, 
I want to point out that picture at the top right there. That is my great grandfather on the left of that picture. Uh, he ran the uh, ferry at White Castle for a time and then uh, went to work for Standard Oil in Baton Rouge. And that's how I became uh, a Baton Rouge guy. But my grandfather, and then the little guy is in the middle, and then the little guy on the right there is my father. Uh, this is a picture taken circa about 1947, 1948, uh, in the estuary in Point Pee Parish at our camp at Falls River, Falls of the Roots. So you'll notice uh, a theme here. There are you know, three more generations of houses in a number of these pictures, and that uh, photograph sort of uh, center left, if you will, is me, my dad, my son, enjoying the estuary near Rama. Or uh, right at the bottom there is my son and my dog, my younger son and my dog, enjoying, uh, again, the resources of the estuary around Marin. Uh, that little boy in the picture up there, you see in a blue shirt on the goggle eye around Grassy Lake, uh, my son in a kayak there at Elmer's Island. Um, my dad and my son, uh, who's holding the drill in that sort of top left picture, uh, installing the planetary warbler nest boxes as part of this Eagle Scout project. That's one of the two of these pictures, I'll admit, are not actually in the estuary, but you get the idea. Uh, a picture again of my family, my dad, my mom, uh, that's my wife, my sister, well, in the top middle there, doing a little birding earlier this year in Lake Martin, and then me and my two sons in Terrebonne Parish around my Floss Lake. Uh, my youngest son had just caught a redfish you see there. So it's not just what I've done uh, professionally. Uh, it's it's what I do. It's, it's what I live. This is where I, I, I live. This is what I love to do. And uh, it's, it's a part of me. So I'm um, excited to be working here in uh, a new capacity, obviously, in estuary with all of you. So my career uh, has primarily been uh, focused within the National Estuary. Of course, my graduate research was done at LSU. I did my research in the estuary at Pascuchon around the Chevron facility there and uh, headquartered at what was the uh, Blumcon facility near the public boat launch and now I believe it's a Nichols facility there. Started my career with the Department of Natural Resources in the late uh, 1990s. Um, a lot of experience there in uh, wetland restoration and planning. Uh, with the Purple Program. Uh, some of you may remember the Coast 2050, one of the early planning documents that was done, uh, was involved with in that. Moved on to work for NOAA Fisheries uh, in the early 2000s for about six or seven years. And that's really where I kind of cut my teeth in sort of the restoration um, uh, arena, working uh, to develop and implement Purple Projects with, uh, with NOAA. Went back to DNR uh, shortly after Hurricanes Katrina and Rita and uh, was happy and I'm proud to have been a part of that organization's uh, evolution, if you will, to uh, OCPR and then to what is now uh, CPRA. And then for a time here uh, in the most recent past, I worked with the governor's office as chair of the CPRA board and the governor's executive, ex executive assistant for coastal activities. So been around a while, even though I'm new to BITDEF, uh, I'm not as new as I probably would like to be in terms of life, but uh, got, a lot of, got a lot of experience. Um, and working with the issues, of course, that face not only uh, most of South Louisiana, but certainly are, are centered and uh, exacerbated and certainly highlighted here in the estuary. So uh, I'm not well on that any longer. So I, I have, in the most recent past, served as Louisiana's both policy and implementation lead uh, for our coastal programs. So I'm proud of that, uh, proud of the work that's been done with CPRA. I uh, was involved in both the passage of the 27, the development of the passage of the 2017 and the 2023 Coastal Master Plans, uh, and the last six or so annual plans that Secret Ready developed uh, with a lot of help. Certainly, I didn't do those things myself, but uh, I'm happy to have been a part of and have led uh, those teams that have done that. And through that time, through my time in sort of leadership roles at Secret Ready, saw the program grow from about half a billion dollars uh, annually to something pushing uh, almost two billion dollars annually. So. So, uh, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is, is uh, you know, we talk about planning and, and studies and things of that nature. And those things are important. They lay the groundwork for the work that we do, but uh, getting projects on the ground, certainly very proud of that. These uh, projects listed here all have their uh, have their fans. Some of them have their anti-fans, but nonetheless, they're all uh, either one of a kind, unique, or the largest of their those kinds of projects in the state's history, indeed, in some cases in the, in the country's history. So. I'm proud to have been a part of CPRA and part of the teams that have gotten these projects uh, either completed or under construction over the last several years. I do want to say, though, that one of the things that really has intrigued me about this position, one of the things that was attractive about coming to BITNEP was the fact that, um, you know, CPRA I kind of describe as uh, can at times be kind of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. 
right? It's kind of a blunt force instrument. There's doing big things kind of uh, in, a, in, a, in a big way, I guess. And while that's great and that's important, and again, I'm very, very proud of the work uh, that we did at CPRA and the work that's ongoing at CPRA, there's another piece of the puzzle there. And I think that that has a really unique opportunity to serve in a niche <clears throat> that um, is not filled by some of our larger state organizations like CPRA and others. And that's not a criticism, it's just a fact of you know, the nature of the kind of work that's done and the scale of the work that's done. But uh, whereas I, I, I sort of liken the work maybe that CPRA does sometimes is being done with a sledgehammer, I think the work that BitNet can do can certainly be done with, with more of a surgical approach, right, a scalpel. Um, and I think there's a niche that can be filled here. And uh, and part of that niche, I think, really involves uh, connecting with people at the estuary, right, and the culture that's here and so forth. And so I'm excited to be a part of that and hopefully to foster that as we uh, move forward. So in terms of where we're headed, um, you know, this is a, a frankly kind of generic and not very shattering, right? But I want to continue to do the good work that's been done here. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, for the last 30 years or so, um, obviously there's been a lot of good things that have come out of BitNet, a lot of good work that's been directed by this management conference, and we need to keep doing those things. Um, I think the science-based consensus-driven uh, approach is, is, is awesome. It's great. It's, it's uh, been very successful for us in the past, and we want to certainly continue to do that. I think we need to continue, uh, you know, obviously with the good partnerships. I mentioned that earlier in my presentation. And for new partnerships, I do want to explore uh, opportunities to work with new new folks, new partners to do, um, you know, new things, of course, um, in line with our action plans, in line with our uh, management plan, of course. And then, uh, obviously, there's a, a need to make sure that we're working very, very closely. I wish you all here at the management conference, uh, our foundation, uh, and our host agency, uh, OneCon, as well. And so, um, I've had good conversations with, uh, again, with all the leaders of each of those organizations, and I think that we are getting off on the right foot and are headed in a good direction as it relates to that. And then lastly, you know, I, I showed you some pictures of my kids earlier, and one of the pieces of advice that they never asked for but that I always give is, uh, you know, do, say what you're going to do and then do it. Um, and I, to me, that's what the CCMP is all about. It's a plan for us uh, to accomplish some things, to get things done. But uh, we've got to deliver. We're not delivering it. It's just words. It's just a document. And so, uh, you know, one of my focuses, I really want to be, uh, the, you know, it, it should be uh, delivering the projects and delivering the things that are mentioned in that uh, in that management plan. And so, then that just brings me to the why. Of course, uh, this is why I think most of us are in this room. It's 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 for our kids. It's for our grandkids. It's so that we can have a place for uh, for them to live, to live, to live, to live work. In the future and experience some of the things that we've all experienced um, over over our lifetimes here uh, in coastal Louisiana and other parts of Louisiana, of course, in the estuary as well. So my approach, I'll, I'll let you know, just to kind of wrap things up here in terms of the introduction of myself will be to, uh, you know, continuously, I think, ask myself and, and ask you all, I think, probably three questions. Uh, the first of that, those, the first of those is, uh, how do we help people continue to live here? How do we help people continue to live in this estuary? Um, the second one of those is how do we make the biggest impact? How can we get the biggest bang for our buck for all of our effort? We've got a tremendous team here that can leverage lots of knowledge, lots of effort with people in the estuary. So how do we do that most effectively to make the biggest impact? And then how do we engage the most people we possibly can? So um, that's the attitude with which I'm coming into this position, and I, I hope uh, that's well received. I hope you all appreciate that. And uh, very much looking forward to, to getting to know everybody much better and uh, to get your feedback on um, on the work that we do here but then how we might be able to improve that uh, if we can. So with that, I'm gonna transition into more of the traditional director's report and talk a little bit about the good work that the staff's been doing over the last quarter. Uh, we'll start off with outreach and some of the work that uh, Emily Bro has been doing. I will make a, a little announcement. Some of you may not have known that Emily was pregnant. She delivered a bouncing baby boy, nine plus pounds. Uh, I, think, I think it was last week. Uh, it might have been the week before, it's very recently. Uh, and uh, everybody's doing well. So they've already visited the BitNet office, so we've got a future estuarian uh, in our midst and uh, has been, been around the office already and, and getting acclimated to, to the very Terry Terrible National Estuary. But uh, one of the things that she was involved in, or a couple of things she's been involved in before she went on maternity leave, was the, the coast of the Louisiana field trip with the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, where uh, a group of school, school children from uh, every region uh, in Oma visited the uh, Marine Lab, of course, on Grand Isle, and they were able to visit. Uh, Elmer's Island and take part in some marine debris and there. 
which brings us to the next item there. It's on the green team cleanup, of course, Emily's uh, been involved, and now Delana has helped pick up some slack, much thanks to her uh, the last couple of weeks of getting our green team down to Elmers Island every week on Friday to clean up, uh, help clean up some of the debris on the island there. Over the last uh, just month or so, we picked up over a hundred and I think 150 or so bags of trash uh, from Elmers Island. So we'll be keeping that area clean. Uh, another effort uh, led by our communications public relations coordinator, Emily Bonwad, um, is an increase in our social um, media presence. Uh, those of you that know me well know I'm not much of a social media guy, but this is kind of the way of the world now. But uh, and so I'm proud to proud to uh, announce that we've increased. I guess our our audience by almost 2,000 folks. So that's good. More people knowing what BitDef is doing and being involved in, in the estuary and what we're doing. It's a great thing. So we've got a total following pushing eight and a half thousand uh, people now, and then our mailing list is reaching over 2,000 folks now. Hopefully, of course, that will increase and continue to improve in the future. Uh, continuing in the outreach vein, uh, Michael Massey, our face of species and marine programs coordinator, has participated in the wet shop just recently and gave a presentation on coastal restoration to the, to the wet shop participants. Those are teachers that are interested in weather uh, education. This uh, occurred in the marine lab again on Grand Isle, and uh, it's a program that's sponsored by the Louisiana. Uh, Wildlife and Fisheries Foundation. So happy to be a part of that and be able to share some of the uh, uh, the knowledge, I guess, that uh, that we have, of course, in, in the program with those teachers that they can then bring back to their schools and their students. And then Michael uh, and Andrew as well have been involved with the Louisiana Master Nationalists uh, Greater New Orleans uh, program. Have presented uh, to that group of folks that are becoming Master Naturalists uh, at the Bell Chase Library most recently, and have been able to uh, attend. Or, or a few, if you will, of one of our one of CPRA's restoration projects, the Bear Reef Shark Bite Restoration Project. So that's a project that's one of a, a suite of projects that has built over 10,000 uh, acres of land over the last six or eight years using material dredged from the Mississippi River onto to create uh, wetlands in the area just to the uh, south and east of the peak in Blackness and Jefferson Parish. So good projects, you're glad to be a part of that. In terms of uh, our habitat restoration and, and plant nursery activities, of course, those are led by Matt Benoit as actually uh, Le'Veon. You guys hope to do them well, but Farm Fridays continue to go uh, go on. I was unable to make the last one, but I'm looking forward, hopefully, to making my first one in September. Uh, I've had 16 volunteers to help do uh, basically work around the farm, so uh, repotting plants, uh, weeding some of the plants, and uh, uh, organizing and sorting through some of those things, sizing the trees, as you see there. Other educational events, of course, we get a lot of visitors to the farm, uh, and I want to encourage any of you, if you've not been there, to, to reach out to us and come check it out. It's uh, certainly part of our facilities that I've been most impressed with. It's uh, it, it's, it's quite an operation going on out there. Kudos to Matt and Ashley who are running a tight ship there. But anyway, you see some of the folks that have been out to visit over the last uh, quarter as well to see what's happening there and learn about things. Couple of projects have wrapped up recently. Uh, Spanish Pass, I mentioned, largest ridge and marsh creation project in the history of the state of Louisiana. We provided the plant materials for that project. Uh, over 60, almost 63,000. Uh, man, we get it, we're getting it down uh, to the specifics there. 62,908 uh, plants for CPRA uh, were, were placed there. That's, uh, you know, in case you're wondering, that's a whole lot of plants. Um, Bunch of work. I was uh, fortunate in my former capacity to be able to see some of that work going on and see some of the plants in the ground afterwards. And uh, that's just a great project. There's some uh, woody species that have been planted out there on the ridge that will be very beneficial to the natural resources, of course, of the estuary. And then other work, uh, again, almost nearly 20,000 plants, 18,700 plants have been installed uh, in Bouchon for a 36 acre marsh creation area. That's some work that uh, Matt and Ashley and some volunteers and some other farm workers that they uh, that they oversee as well have been uh, spending a good bit of the summer in the heat and some less than ideal conditions getting those plants in the ground. So another good project that's been happening. Moving on to some of the biological resources and wildlife conservation uh, efforts. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this, so I'll not talk too much about it from uh, Dr. Johnson here in just a bit. But uh, one of the things that, that Elena does is maintain four different purple horn colonies throughout the estuary, one in Plaquemine, one in uh, New Rose, one in Coventry, and one in Grand Isle. And uh, they've just been very successful. She not only maintains and monitors those things, puts them up, takes them down, and so forth. But um, one of the interesting things to me about this is that uh, 
there's almost 100% capacity, 100% uh, occupancy, occupancy, I should say, uh, in these uh, uh, these installations. It just highlights the the need uh, for nest sites for these birds. It's the largest swallow species in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so literally hundreds of birds were housed in these facilities, and uh, hundreds more were fledged this year. So a uh, neat project, and uh, many of you have probably seen those either at Lunkha, Grand Isle, uh, other places around the estuary. So moving on, uh, this is a, a unique and interesting project. If you'll see, uh, notice the guy in the middle of the picture there is holding a bird. To me, it's probably the most striking bird that we see in coastal Louisiana. It's a swallowtail kite. So we're doing some work with um, the Orleans Office Society, Dr. Jennifer uh, Coulson, and uh, putting GPS tracking devices on these birds uh, to get a better idea. We don't know very much about them, right? So we get a better idea about where they go, how they get there, um, and where they winter. So uh, one of the first things I learned about, one of the first projects I learned about when I got on the job here was this project. And I tell you, my reaction was, I gotta see this. Um, so apparently we, uh, Dr. Coulson, um, has a rehab great horned owl that she uses to basically corral uh, the swallowtail kites into a mist nest so that they can be captured and fitted with uh, a GPS satellite tracker. So um, that's not something you see every day. Definitely something I'm looking forward to seeing and, and being a part of uh, in, in the near future. Um, another thing you'll note uh, is that we'll have a new publication coming out uh, here shortly. We're working with uh, USGS and Bones Glorioso to develop the uh, document Amphibians of Louisiana. And uh, I don't think it's been announced yet, so I think I'm, I'm, I'm making an announcement, but this will also be the theme of the upcoming uh, chronograph calendar, so the duties of Louisiana. Uh, I'll also note that we're working diligently to get that out uh, a little bit more timely, hopefully, uh, obviously, before the first of the year. And, uh, but but keep, keep on the lookout for that and know that that will be uh, coming up here in the near future. And just a couple more things, bear with me if you will, but uh, one of the other things that Natalie is working on is the Louisiana Professional Native Landscape Certification Program. And this, of course, aim of this is to encourage uh, our landscaping community and landscapers across the, uh, across the estuary, really across the coast, to incorporate more native plants into their designs and into their installations and understand how to identify, care for, and maintain those landscapes as well. I believe you all had a presentation about this at the last um, management conference meeting, Cynthia, Louisiana, facility dedication. Michael Massimi, our invasive uh, species coordinator, was able to attend this. And our involvement here, of course, is uh, supporting the uh, assessment and optimization of plant biosystems. This is, of course, a company that is using an invasive species water hyacinth to make these uh, biodegradable plant pots and uh, is a value added, obviously, opportunity in terms of uh, getting rid, hopefully, of trolling. Uh, an invasive species that we're all very familiar with and can be problematic and also producing uh, a product that has economic value with those. Um, and then finally, I'll mention that we are wrapping up our Fighting Foosh Watershed uh, Home Solution System Program project. So Andrew Barron and Siva Luna, uh, who you all I'm sure you know, are working on this stuff. This has been very successful. I believe we were able to um, uh, to provide assistance to Andrew Craig, if I'm wrong, I think it was about 170 homeowners uh, in the region in this watershed to improve uh, their uh, sewage treatment plants and ultimately improve water quality, of course, in the basin. And so I do have just a couple of minor things I want to mention. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce uh, a new staff member. We hired a student worker. Uh, she just started on Monday. Her name is Natalie Zach. I'm not sure where she is, but if she can stand up and wave her hand, I'd like everybody get an opportunity to know who she is and say hello. Uh, perhaps she went back to the office, so maybe she's not here. But anyway, uh, if you come to the office in an afternoon and you see a young lady at the front desk, uh, it's probably not. So I hope you get a chance to meet her. Um, as you all probably know, we've been there, students are. Hey, Natalie. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, as you all know, I'm sure that you've been without a, a deputy director for some time, and just to keep you up to speed, we'll be uh, taking off the search process and that, uh, that effort to try to fill that position here in the very near future as well. Um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Fontenot and I have talked about as well is I know we have a, a very uh, a pleasant, welcoming, and sort of cozy home here on Nichols, but uh, one of the things we're considering is perhaps rotating our management conference meetings around the estuary and some other parts of the estuary. Um, so if you get to your announcement for the next quarter's meeting, uh, don't assume that it's going to be here too. Though. It may be, but it also may be in some other part of the estuary. So of course, the, the idea there would just be a little more exposure, a little more engagement, hopefully, in other parts of the estuary. 
uh, was maybe some individuals that uh, they don't come to or, or don't uh, come, don't know much about the program. Um, office space. So those of you that have been in our office space know that there's a, a they're not the best. Uh, they're not bad, but they're not the best in the world either. And so just to keep you up to speed, I have been talking with Dr. Clune and uh, with Lacey Colosso, who's the director of the new Postal Center, about the possibility of us uh, having some office space in that center and perhaps relocating there in the near future. Um, not that you all need to know this, but again, I just want to make sure everybody's kind of aware of what's going on. We will be uh, having a visit from our EPA sponsors uh, in September, September 11th, 12th. Uh, I was notified that we were uh, selected for an advanced grants review. I know that sounds very exciting mm -hmm. uh, to all of you, but actually I, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a very good opportunity and sort of a forced opportunity for me to become uh, very familiar with our grants and all the projects and uh, understand kind of what's expected of this program of us as a staff from EPA. And then lastly, and I'll, uh, I'll take any questions that we may have. I know um, Dr. Uh, LaFleur will talk a little bit more about the White Boot Gallop, but I'm looking forward to that. That's coming up. Uh, at the end of September, and then of course, uh, Adam Mike with Bush uh, is coming up as well in October. Thank you. So, good to see many of you participating in that. Um, so, I'll end there. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions, uh, Quentin, if, if that's acceptable. And uh, if not, uh, we can move on. But uh, excited to be here again and very much looking forward to getting to know everybody and, uh, and forging some good relationships and uh, getting some good work done. Thank you. Any questions for the board? Thank you all. Um, Brent, I want to say on behalf of the management conference that we are delighted and happy that you are here as a, as a director. And I believe that we are really looking forward to a good things coming up in the future. So, welcome. Thank you. Of course. All right. So next up, we're going to hear from Dr. Gary LaFleur for the foundation. Okay. Thanks, Quentin. My name is Gary LaFleur. I'm serving as the president of the Baratari Fairbone Esquire Foundation. Just want to remind you that what we do is we're a 501c3 that helps FitNet by receiving funds for grants and distributing them for the stakeholder that has that grant. So sometimes we help things going on at FitNet. Sometimes we help other stakeholders like the National Park here in in Thibodeau or someone like uh, Wildlife and Fisheries, if they have a project like the Green Team, we accept that money and then we help distribute it. So we just met this past week. We're doing great at the Esquire Foundation. One big thing to announce is we have a new member and that is Rissa Enselman, who's in the room. Wave, Rissa, where are you? She's up in the, up in the front there. So Rissa is an instructor with me and Quentin in biological sciences but she was a student of our own Malawsol. So she's part of that Malawsol legacy. She also worked at Grand Isle with oysters. So she has a deep understanding of the estuary. And we're really happy to have Rissa on board with the Estuary Foundation. The other thing that I want you to know is we have the White Boot Gala coming up. Now that's something that we do once a year. We do a whole lot of hard work in this estuary, but the White Boot Gala is a night where we take it easy and we kind of enjoy fellowship and celebration, which is something that our estuary probably does better than other estuaries all, all around. We're gonna do that at Spars and Dissolvents. That's coming up September 24th. And we would love to have you all there. And we are very appreciative that we already have a few sponsors. Many of them are in the room, like Lowlander and Chris Peterson here, Joe Sines, Susan Pestro, Baratron, Synergy, and Restorer Retreat have all stepped up to help be some of our sponsors. And some of y'all at the table have all also donated awesome prizes, like Tim Allen and Apache have come up already and said there's going to be a frogging adventure that's going to be one of our prizes. So if you're interested in that, you need to be there. The cost is 70 bucks a ticket if you get those early. And so you can talk to Nicole that and if you want to reserve a ticket. And we also do have some sponsor levels that are still available. So think about that. Okay, so we're looking forward to seeing you on September 24th in Dissolvents at Spars. They're going to be serving food that you never see on the menu. It's like special food just for us. It's double secret menu. We'd, we'd love to see you there. And that's it from the Esquire Foundation. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. LaFleur. Are there any questions for Dr. LaFleur? Yes. Dr. LaFleur, 
how does one donate to the auction and how does one donate to the uh, foundation? Nicole, Nicole Babin. <clears throat> Nicole Babin at the office is ready to take your check. She's ready to take your item that you would like to donate, like for the auction or something like that. You can bring that over to the BitNet office. Nicole does an awesome job of organizing that. Or you can email me if you have more questions about that. Yeah, like in the past, we've had awesome items like a canoe or art or wine or something that was like uh, conservation minded like a rain barrel. Any of these things would, would be awesome donation items. And so maybe look around your house or buy something brand new, bring that over to Nicole. You, wanna, you don't wanna do it the night of, of the event. You wanna get that to her at least two weeks ahead of time. So, so we know that's on the list. All right? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, Nicole's ready? Yeah, okay. Yep, and tickets are available now. You can see Nicole uh, get uh, your tickets for the thing because it, it will sell out. So if you really want to come, you want to get your, your tickets early. Any other questions for Dr. Lafarge? Okay, thank y'all. All right, um, up next, we're going to hear from Dr. Eric Johnson. He's going to talk to us about Community Science Nest Monitor. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Brad. It's great to see you more like that. Um, it's great to see familiar faces out here. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm the Director of Conservation Science with Audubon Delta. Um, Audubon Delta is one of 16 uh, state or regional offices of the National Audubon Society, which is the oldest 501c3 nonprofit bird conservation organization in the world. Um, we use birds as a lens to inform conservation challenges of our day. Uh, it started with um, the, the plume trade, with great egrets and snow egrets being <laughs> slaughtered. And E.A. McElhenney was one of the founding uh, chapter presidents of the Louisiana or uh, Audubon Society um, back in the early 1900s and helped pass some of the early legislation. So Audubon's roots in Louisiana go deep. Uh, we have Audubon's oldest and largest sanctuaries in uh, our network is, is in Vermillion Parish. It's the Paul J. Rainey Wildlife Sanctuary. It's 26,000 acres of coastal wetlands. And so, you know, we today are faced with issues of climate change, with habitat loss. I'll talk a little bit about bird declines. Um, and it's really a signal that, that things are not going going well. And what are the, some of the things that we can do as a society, as a community, to bring birds back and restore the ecosystem for the preservation, not only for birds, but for people who depend on this landscape as well. And so this particular project that I'll be talking about today, we call Urban Native Greens, it's really uh, helping emphasize the idea that bird conservation can begin in your backyard, in your community. Conservation is not something that happens out there. It is something that is central to our lives and that we can implement on a daily basis uh, to help our feather friends and to sustain the future for our, uh, um, you know, for our future generations. So, um, <coughs> I want to start off with this recognition that um, urbanization and urban sprawl, and particularly suburban and peri-urban sprawl, are rampant across the United States and many parts of the world. Um, as you see on the graphic on the left, uh, those, those red and yellow dots indicate highly urbanized areas across the landscape. It's fragmenting the natural world. And the graph on the right is a 300 uh, plus years time span uh, with the green showing the proportion of the U.S. population um, that lives in rural areas versus the blue, the proportion of the population that lives in urban areas. And as you can see, urban growth is the primary driver of population, <laughs> human population uh, change in, in the United States over, over the last 300 years. And what's happening is that bird populations have been declining at a rapid rate. Uh, we've been measuring this since really the mid-1960s. 
And since about 1970, we have lost 3 billion birds in the United States and Canada. Uh, that's about 29% of the bird population. Again, birds being an indicator of our ecosystem health. This is telling us that something is wrong. And um, so this is especially pronounced in migratory birds and aerial insectivores. So these are birds that fly like purple martins and depend on insects by catching them on the wing. Um, purple martins are also migratory, as is the proprietary warbler that was on the, the title slide. Um, so those are the kinds of birds that seem to be particularly hard to hit. Not necessarily the blue jays, the cardinals, the chickadees, the Carolina wrens, the mockingbirds, the more familiar birds of our backyard. It's the ones that are migratory that's, that we get to borrow for a few months of the year, and they spend the rest of their life cycle traveling to more tropical places. We're also seeing a large decline in the insect population of the continent. And so this particular graph on the left shows the proportion of insect species in different orders. So we have Coleoptera, Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, um, Od uh, Odonates, and Orthoptera um, from left to right. And the red shows the proportion of species that are declining in each of those orders. Uh, it's particularly pronounced in, in, the, in the grasshoppers, the Orthoptera, um, but also our bees and ants, butterflies, moths, dragonflies and beetles are declining at alarming rates. And this is the basis of the food chain for things like birds. On the right, we have another graph that shows the effects of disturbance on Lepidoptera, on the butterflies and moths. And the dots that are on the left side of that line indicate where there's lower diversity of Lepidoptera in disturbed areas compared to dots on the right where there's higher diversity in disturbed areas. And so you can see most the effect the effects of diversity, uh, the effect of disturbance on diversity is, is pronounced. Another way to look at the impacts of the human built environment on wildlife is to look at the change in um, forest the uh, forest community across the United States um, over a period of about 300 years. So from the early 1600s, in this case, to the early 1900s. If you were to continue this today, there's only about 4% of the United States that are considered pristine. In other words, is not impacted by things like invasive species, uh, urban expansion, uh, pesticide spraying, changes in hydrology, and so on and so forth. There's almost nothing left that is pristine in the United States. And so this idea, again, that conservation is something that needs to happen out there, is, is a fallacy. It really needs to start with each one of us in this room. And so the, the, the program that I'll be talking about today is this Urban Native Green Program. And there are seven simple ways that people can help birds, help wildlife, and improve the biodiversity of their communities. And this particular program addresses three of these seven issues. One is the uh, uh, to, to conduct citizen science, to help us understand what's happening in the world around us. Another is to use native plants. Um, BitNet is an amazing uh, uh, group that is advocating for native plants, that is uh, growing native plants, it's distributing native plants, um, and we're proud to call them a partner in this project. And then the third thing is to avoid or minimize use of pesticides. Now, most of the time, I don't talk about completely eliminating pesticides. We have had we have so many invasive species in our environment um, that sometimes the only way to control them is through uh, spraying or, or um, you know other kinds of methods like that. And so, the idea that we, we shouldn't use pesticides at all is probably also a fallacy. But by minimizing them and using them strategically, um, can help can help us uh, improve the diversity of the lands around. And so this program really begins with gardening. This program begins with creating natural environments in places that have been highly modified by the human built environment. Um, this idea with gardening with nature. Gardening is something that we all have to unlearn. We've all been taught that gardening is something that needs to be um, aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. Uh, this is a very colonial uh, perspective on gardening, that everything has to be neat and tidy. It was really gardening evolved from a place of showing wealth 
and, uh, and power. Um, it was a way of demonstrating how, um, uh, you know, how wealthy people were by having pristine, uh, um, beautiful gardens. And so the idea that a hole on a leaf caused by an insect that is feeding on that leaf became something that was a no-no, right? We, we are taught that that is a bad thing, but fundamentally plants serve as the basis of the food web for these insects. And insects serve as the base of the food web for many of our favorite birds, like the thonotary warblers and purple martins. And so when we garden with nature, when we in introduce and encourage nature into our yards, we can, we can build structures, we can build ecological structures that support a diversity of insects, a diversity of plants, and a diversity of birds and have a much more beautiful landscape. We have to unlearn what beautiful is and relearn that ecosystem health is something beautiful. Dr. Doug Towley, an entomologist with the uh, University of Delaware, has written a tremendous amount and studied a tremendous amount of the role of native plants on insect communities, and in turn, how those insect communities benefit birds. So this particular graph on the right here shows in green, uh, the proportion or the number, I'm sorry, the number of caterpillar species that use native plants versus non-native similar plants of the same genus. Um, and so on the left, we have the oaks, then we have cherries, then we have maples, and then we have basswoods. And, and by and large, our native oaks support twice as many caterpillar species as non-native oaks, oaks that come from other continents. Our native plants are also better adapted to our climate. Um, it's they're more, uh, 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 you know, they're more used to these extreme droughts that we experienced last year, extreme wet periods that we experienced early this year, and they fundamentally require less care than non-native imported species that require constant watering, nutrient additions, pesticide spraying, so on and so forth. Um, our native plants are more resilient to, to pests as well because they have co-evolved with the insect species that live in these environments and have a symbiotic relationship with them. What's considered native? It ultimately depends on your perspectives, right? Native could be something that is very local to your ecoregion that has uh, a genetic line that is most closely adapted to the environment around you. But of course, as we're experiencing climate change, uh, these changes are happening faster than plants can evolve, especially if we're considering oak species that live three, four, five hundred <laughs> years, sometimes a thousand years. And so maybe native might be something, you know, in your state or across the northern Gulf Coast or maybe across the southeastern United States or maybe even the Americas as hummingbird species are wintering further and further north. We can introduce uh, beautiful hummingbird flowers from Mexico and South Texas into, into Louisiana lawns and, and, uh, and gardens and help support wintering hummingbird species that are, that are using our, uh, our South Louisiana landscape in, in higher numbers these days. And insects are inherently amazing. They're inherently cool. This is just a small sampling of moss species that I've documented in my own backyard. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I have over 100 plant species in my yard, which is translated into over 450 moss species in my yard. And so I go out at night every now and again, put out a black light, I photograph the, the moss that are coming to my yard and try to identify some really, really beautiful uh, creatures out there. And this is, these are food, this is bird food. Um, they're not just beautiful, they have a purpose, right? And so, one uh, pair of chickens, for example, needs 6,000 caterpillars to raise its young. None of these baby birds are fed seeds. None of these baby birds are fed fruit. They depend 100% on insects in order to be successfully raised. And so, yes, it's great to put out plants like beautyberry, which support you know, birds in migration with those fruits. Um, but those beauty berries also have an insect community associated with it that birds depend on. And fundamentally, that is even more important um, to sustain bird populations by allowing birds to reproduce successfully. So hopefully I've convinced you to go native. 
Um, if you're interested in learning more about what kind of plants are suitable for your particular uh, backyard, um, you can visit Audubon's Native Plants for Birds website. It's a, it's a continental website, and all you have to do is punch in your zip code, and it will punch out a list of native plant species uh, from your area and which kinds of birds they will support. So, for example, if you're interested in bringing hummingbirds to your yard, you can filter the outputs by hummingbird species. If you're interested in trees, uh, you can filter by trees. If you're interested in nut producing plants, you can filter by that. So it's, it's very um, interactive and a great resource. There are also, um, at the bottom of every output, it'll tell you uh, a list of, of vendors that provide native plants in your region. It's not ever complete. Um, we're always looking to up, update that. So if there are vendors in your area that you know sell native plants and it's on the list, we'd like to promote them to this website as well. So that brings me to Audubon's um, Urban Native Greens program. We're doing native plant restoration across our three state region of Audubon, uh, in Audubon Delta, that's Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi. And uh, we're trying to encourage citizen scientists to help us understand how birds are responding to the use of native plants in their landscape. And so the goal of this program is fundamentally to increase the availability and use of native plants um, across the region, create habitat for wildlife, especially birds, sequester carbon, improve drainage and improve uh, and reduce the risk of flooding to communities and improve air, water, and noise quality. We're proud to include BitNet as one of the founding partners of this program. Uh, we just launched this program this, this year, and so we're, we're really building from the ground up here, so to speak. We're also partnering with the LSU Ag Center uh, and Dr. Sabrina Taylor's lab, um, who's going to be analyzing a lot of the data for this. Um, she will have three graduate students that are uh, participating in this project. One of them already began this summer. One is just starting this fall, and we have a third one coming in in January. And we also work with other local uh, nonprofit organizations. And our science questions are, are centered around how birds respond to the built environment, particularly how they respond to pest control and ornamental breeding. And our hypotheses are that mosquito spraying will decrease the prevalence of vector-borne pathogens like malaria. How many people here in this room have ever gotten malaria in the United States? <laughs> it's usually zero, right? Because we've controlled it through mosquito spraying, particularly during the DDT area. Malaria was, human malaria was extirpated from the United States in the 1950s, right? And so there's still this huge, there's still avian malaria out there, uh, which are transmitted through mosquitoes. And mosquito spraying may actually provide a benefit to birds in terms of reducing the risk of exposure to avian malaria. However, it can also decrease the non-target insect, uh, insect uh, community. So not just mosquitoes, but also dragonflies. We know that mosquito spraying definitely harms bees and, and other kinds of, uh, of insects. So that may have an impact on the food availability for birds. We also predict that an increased urbanization will decrease our prey availability and diet threat. So just the, the fact that we're landscaping less and less with native plants and introducing non-native species um, can have an effect on the prey ability of birds. Adding native plants uh, will increase arthropod prey availability and their diet threat. And that these outcomes will affect the bird's condition, nest success, and survivorship. And so this is where the community and scientists come into play in monitoring nests to help us understand the responses of birds to these questions. We're focusing on two year-round resident species, the Carolina wren and the Carolina chickadee, as well as two migratory species that have declining populations. That's the prothonotary warbler and the purple worm. The phenology of these birds is endlessly fascinating. Um, birds begin laying their, their eggs, often in uh, late March or early April, um, and they'll continue nesting through mid-July. So we're kind of getting at the end of the nesting season right now. Um, I'm not going to get into all these details right here, but they all kind of follow a similar methodology. The data collectors in this project include nest monitors. Um, those are people who are collecting fecal samples. We'll talk about that in a little bit in a, little, in a second here. And then we also have bird banders, people that are licensed to catch birds uh, and collect issue samples from wild birds. 
uh, where there are people like myself and Elena, have Jed over here on the far end, and maybe other license expanders in the room. Um, but you do need a license to do it. But right now, I'm just going to mostly talk about the community size part, the nest monitors. So nest monitoring for the for the three songbird species, the monetary warblers, the chickadees, and the wrens. Uh, we want people to check nests about once a week if they're not active, and then once those nests become active, check them twice a week. Purple martins can be checked about once a week. Um, these all of these birds will utilize nest boxes or nest structures that we can put out there and help facilitate uh, their nesting. We can also predator guard those boxes, and so we can remove the effect of uh, predation on understanding nest success and sort of isolating the, the role of insect um, diversity on, the, uh, on bird nest success. There are different kinds of ways of predator guarding or building nest boxes or deploying them. There's trade-offs and how hard it is versus how easy it is versus how you know, long-term they can last versus how much they need annual replacement. But generally speaking, you can build a predator guard and a box um, from you know pieces at Lowe's for about 20 minutes. Here's one of the examples of nest boxes. We have high school students that are building these for us. We have um, you know volunteers in the community that are building these for us. You can get an eight-foot cedar uh, or sorry, six-foot untreated fence plank and build two nest boxes for the cost of about six dollars. The diameter of the hole should be 1.25 inches in diameter. Bluebirds will only use 1.5, so this isn't a project that will necessarily support bluebirds, but 1.25 will exclude brown-headed cowbirds and nest parasite from these boxes. In the hundreds and hundreds of nests that we've monitored in these boxes, we've had zero brown-headed cowbird um, parasitism. And this is ultimately what we want. We want to know how babies are doing. Um, but we also want their, their fecal samples. That fecal sample is filled with DNA of the insects that they have been eating, that they have been fed by their parents. And the lab at LSU will analyze the environmental DNA in that poop uh, and do what's called um, high throughput metabarcoding, where they can extract DNA sequences, compare it against an insect database, and tell us about the diversity of insects that these birds have been fed. So if you're interested in getting involved in this project, um, please feel free to reach out to Delano LeBlanc. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, feel free to uh, connect with your, your favorite BitNet partner. Um, we have a website that is a nest uh, monitoring uh, entry program called urbanleadergreens.fieldscope.org. Our partners at FieldScope have helped us build this customized website to collect data. As you can see, we have over uh, we're approaching 6,000 nest observations, and we'll summarize those at the end of each year and uh, provide outputs on how birds are doing. Um, and then that data will serve as the foundation of helping us understand the role of mosquito spraying and native plant diversity on birds. If you're interested in getting involved in actually weighing nestlings and collecting fecal samples, you do need a permit to do that. Um, I hold a master permit and can some permit people that have gone through a, a pretty easy training, um, but it needs to be hands-on. And there are permitted trainers across our region um, that you can work with. Uh, go out to the field with them, weigh some nestlings, collect some fecal samples, and get trained on doing this. And there are places all across South Louisiana as well uh, where you can get involved in this work. So that's it. I hope... Um, helped enlighten some of the roles of insects in our, in our world and the benefits that they provide. And um, a couple slides on it. And that's it. So I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Here's my contact information. Here's some of the websites uh, to get involved. And um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And listen, I can attest to what you're saying. Our backyard is full of needles, and then we have a lot of really cool insects, moths, and all that. We take pictures and I post them all on social media. Well, a neighbor asked me one time on social media, point, how come we have so many more cool bugs in your backyard than I do? 
I told her, well, probably because I don't cut my grass as often as I should. <laughs> that, anyway, but yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's wonderful having all those native species in the backyard. It's not just the bugs, but the birds that come in, some hummingbirds and all. Yep. Any questions for Dr. Johnson? One thing I'll say is, is with the mowing part, right? And there's there's actually some studies out there that show if you delay your mowing to every other week schedule versus every week schedule, you can double your insects biomass. Not gonna test. Yeah. We won't we won't ask the uh, homeowners associations what they, how they feel about it. Oh, okay. So uh, you mentioned the uh, the banding training, I guess, uh, Dr. Johnson. Is that something people can just contact you about or? Yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, with with weighing nestlings, it actually it doesn't require putting a band on a bird, so the permitting hurdle is relatively small. Um, you do need a permit just to handle the bird. I see. Basically, take it out of the nest, put it on a scale, um, record the weight, and then put the bird back into the nest. It literally takes a couple of minutes, and if they if they provide a fecal sample for you, you would then collect that in, in a special way and deposit it in a vial. We provide all the resources. Um, for that. Um, and so I would just need to get that person sub permitted under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Permit. And, and they're good to go. Great. Thank Still you. Dancing ball. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Yeah, next, we're going we're gonna to watch a video. It's, it's not the full length video, but a shortened version of it. And um, I'm going to let David Tilton tell us a little bit about it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Ogan. I'm with the Jefferson Parish Department of Ecosystem and Coastal Management. Um, today, we're going to screen a, a short version of that, a documentary style film uh, we created. It was initially um, created to kind of as a distinct way to inform policy makers in DC uh, to try to increase uh, awareness of fun with the states and parishes counties get from the um, you know, Exploitation is called. Um, and um, it also kind of frames um, some of the ecological degradation as a national problem that affects uh, a lot of the social and cultural, um, I guess, aspects of our society down here, as well as uh, ecological and economical. Um, I know I don't have much time, so I'll just let the film speak for itself. Um, you all might recognize a few Interviews as well. Watch stand in Louisiana because it's part of you. I have lived here for 33 years. I moved here in 1989 with no intention of staying here. I was going to finish my PhD and I was going to go someplace else and light the world on fire as the best waterfowl biologist on the face of the earth. Um, didn't work out that way and I don't care because the resources that are here, the wetlands, the woodlands, the people, the culture are magnificent. They're, they become a part of you. What Louisiana is in terms of a habitat, and I mean as a habitat for human beings as well as for wildlife, is incredibly unique and inspiring and fulfilling when you participate in it. And a hurricane, yes, it happens, just like earthquakes happen. You know? Tornadoes happen. All kinds of things happen. And, and it, it's going to structure what you can be. But none of those things is going to change the foundation of what Louisiana is. Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River. It was built by that river changing course 
sediments and, and water spreading out over the landscape, Louisiana is still going to be that. And, and we need to enhance that, maintain that as best as we can because we really don't have a choice. I've met New Yorkers. If 9-11 happens 10 times, you're not going to tell New Yorkers, why don't you move? Bostonians, I've been there. Oh, sir, that is an incredibly unique and wonderful culture. Rude as all hell. But, they, but you're not going to tell those people, why don't you move? And, and so here we are in Louisiana with everything we provide to the nation, the oil and gas, the seafood, the carbon sequestration, America's wealth, and the cultural icon that is New Orleans, and the shipping and the commerce that comes through it. Louisiana will never be removed from the processes of the Mississippi River. That's what it's always going to be. The people that are here, it's in them. It's who they are. And so the question, why don't you move? It's a non-start. It's a non-start. Ian Dario, from Commercial Vision. And I've lived in the deep. As far as I know, pretty much all my life. You know what most people do in the deep bird For work, most people do commercial fish. They uh, draw, they grab, they fish draw fish. Uh, a little bit of ice dip, but that's too much. Would it be fair to say it's fishing kind of in the industry here? Fishing with a violin industry. This is just a family thing. That's what we grew up doing. This is what we do. The cultural diversity in terms of Paris and from all the way from Canada and Mary right next to New Orleans, all the way down to the Jalapena of Southern Island community, and even further south of Grand community of Mary Island on the Gulf of Mexico. You know, we're, we're surrounded by majestic waterways. We're surrounded by national water on every side of the town. When you wake up in the morning, which come up after you see a shrimp boat, someone more and more, you know, very, very close to the community, hard working people. Uh, but it, it really, it, what it sounds so to you, it hurts. So we have an interesting community that's kind of like a little peninsula that's that kind of leads out from Jefferson Parish. Um, we've got you know, Crown Point, Lafitte, Lower Lafitte, Barracks area, and they each kind of are these peninsulas and almost like a little island out there. Um, and they didn't always look like islands sticking out down into the bottom of Jefferson Parish and the Barracks area basin. There were old forests that surrounded them. I'll hear stories from people who would hunt and trap and, and do a lot of things in the area surrounding Lafitte, where now, when you look at Lafitte on a map, it looks like the island of Baratari. You go across a bridge, and they're surrounded by water on all sides, but that didn't exist before. When I first saw a picture of my dad, it was, it was really good, you know. And now it's due to erosion, I guess. Uh, everything's so so wide open now. When a tide falls, it just it falls straight out. When it comes up, it comes straight in. Nothing triples. And I think that got a lot to do with it, you know. One of the, the interesting pieces for me as I came into this job was really looking at the marshland that exists in Jefferson Parish. We have this huge Barrett's area basin that goes all the way from the west bank of Jefferson Parish all the way down to Grand Isle. And the amount that has just disappeared in the past, you know, 50, 150 years is unbelievable. My dad used to tell me all the time, you know, when I was a kid, they had land, they had this here. And I didn't notice it 
until now that I remember when I was a kid that there was something that it's, it's, it's gone. Yeah, okay, so subsidence is, is one of the most difficult concepts around my head right now. First time someone said it, tried to explain it to me. They told me the ground's going down. I'm like, that's a good here? Like, yeah, right here. I said, what about over there? Yep. Everywhere you can see is going down, but it's not going down the same everywhere. Uh, and so what's happening is the ground is deflating. There's a little bit of water trapped down there. And the weight of all the mud on top is smooshing the stuff from the bottom, so the water's working its way up. But the ground's deflating. Once it's really old, like you know, thirty thousand years old, it doesn't go down anymore. But every every river across this planet, as it enters the ocean, it's in a valley that was about three hundred feet deep during the last ice age. So you have all that material there that's young, but really rapid subsidence in every river valley, at the middle of every river valley. All right, so the water's coming down the river, it's in that channel, and at the end of the springtime, it's the book. It. You know, there's a lot of water squeezed in there, and it's the, because it's gone fast, it can carry a sediment, heavy, uh, carry heavy sediments, and it can carry it faster and more of it. As a, a river comes out of its banks, that water slows. And when it slows, it can't carry sediment as much. And so the first thing is to fall out into the sands, and then slow some more, and the silts fall out, and then the clay is actually fall out a little bit on them. And when it gets to the end, when the, all that water gets to the end of the river, the water all spreads out at once. When you look at the, the Champalite Delta Wildlife Management Area, you can see that the sediment began to build land. And then these arteries, um, you know, develop through the thing. And those arteries direct and build delta, And other arteries form. And it starts to build land. And these other arteries develop. And if there's enough flow, then those arteries develop other deltas. And that's how all of this builds. Sediment is the lifeblood of maintaining and growing marsh. I would never sit like this. Cool. Thank you. Like the queen. <laughs> I think one thing that most people need to understand is there is no status quo in Louisiana. You know, um, all those years ago, we were growing and changing, and the river was building up. It was building up. It would uh, change its course and build another delta. And, and that was, again, there's no status quo. It was always changing. And then when we severed that connection to the river, we, we just started to decline. <laughs> The Corps of Engineers, this incredible group of men, you know, began to levy the river. You guys know this story. Now we've got all this arable land that we can grow food. We've got navigable channels. We've got places where people can live. And where people live, they build things and buy things and create an economic engine. But when you levy the river, what's it say on the wall over there? Unintended consequences. And so now we have restricted that river. We've kept it from diverting where it wants to divert. And so by doing that, we have deprived the coastal zone of Louisiana of overland flood, which deposits sediment and fresh water into the marshes. And, and that's a big problem to the, the, the maintenance of, of marsh habitat in our state. The federal government uh, through all my crops build levees um, uh, around the Mississippi River with no plan to, to feed that coast. And now you see it, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people suffering those consequences of uh, those bad decisions. And the state is in the town and, and working as far as they can to preserve the coast, but it should be a federal effort because the problem was created in a huge form by the federal government. 
it's really left us in the place where salt water is moving further north. And as the salt water moves further north, these plants are sitting in salt water. If it's not able to rinse that salt off, it will start to um, die. And then you kind of lose a cypress for it. Then you lose this other marshland and you're kind of, now you just have empty patches of mud. And the next time storm surge comes, that mud is easily washed away, which is leading to that coastal erosion. We are losing a football field of land every 100 minutes. I don't even think people can put their mind around that. We have lost the entire state of Delaware, gone. So, can you just get your name and application? Sure. My name is Bren Haas. I'm the Executive Director of Louisiana's Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority. What do you need to all this work? Well, I'm from Louisiana. Uh, have spent uh, many, many, many hours along its coast, fishing, boating, hunting, all, all of the above. And so I've just always been had a real connection with the coast. Uh, and then, of course, spending time along the coast as I have, I've, I've seen uh, I've seen it disappear. And, uh, you know, kind of uh, just a real passion for wanting to try to restore that ecosystem for, for everyone in the future, including my, my children. One of, the, one of the biggest issues facing coastal we have is a lack of sediment input, right, into our coastal system. That delta plain is built uh, entirely by sediment that was delivered to South Louisiana from all over the country, and a little bit of Canada being delivered by the Chapelon River and, uh, of course, the Mississippi River, which is the uh, biggest river in, in North America. And so we've levied that river. We've isolated the river from its coastal wetlands that it once built to nourish uh, for good reasons, for flood control and to improve transportation. It's a major navigation artery for most of the country. But in isolating the river from those coastal wetlands, we've cut off essentially the lifeblood to those wetlands that, uh, that created them in the first place. And so a big part of Louisiana's plan to restore our coast is to reconnect it with those wetlands. Anywhere in Louisiana where we see the river connected to the coast, we see healthy, vibrant, growing land. Other places where the river's not connected to the Gulf, we see, unfortunately, uh, our land deteriorating and eroding. There's tremendous amount of support for, for coastal restoration and protection here in Louisiana. Every coastal master plan that has gone through multiple committees and the two entire chambers of the Louisiana legislature it has passed unanimously. Mm -hmm. So we have a vision for our coast. It's called Louisiana's Master Plan for Sustainable Coast. It's a way to make very tough decisions about what we think the priorities for the coast should be. So we can't do everything we want to do for all of our citizens. Uh, we can't rebuild our entire ecosystem. We don't have all the money. We don't have all the sediment. We don't have all the fresh water that we need. So uh, within those constraints, um, you know, how do you make the best choices uh, for our coast? So the master plan employs uh, what's been called a multiple lines of defense approach or strategy, right? Um, and so the importance of that kind of strategy really came to light uh, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and, and Hurricane Katrina in 2005, uh, hurricane season, of course. After Katrina, Hurricane Katrina and Rita, we really developed this idea of multiple lines of defense. Anything between us and that is, is what we need. It really was an eye-opening uh, time, I think, in the state's history, and that we really realized that, man, those, those ridges, those barrier islands, those marshes uh, are important, actually, risk reduction features because they can slow down and knock down uh, storm surges. It helps because it's a structure. It's something that the water has to hit. It's something that removes energy. So our multiple lines of fence really begin at the very outermost edges of our coast, and that starts with our barrier islands and barrier shorelines. So places like Grand Mountain and um, uh, Grand Terre and the Barrier Terry Basin. And then as you move closer in, we need that marsh. We need the mangroves. We need the cypress forest to absorb what's coming before our coastal community. <laughs> And then you get into uh, sort of the more man-made things, so levees, 
floodgates, flood walls, elevated houses, uh, you know, getting on the tower, kind of marginal, but the flood. Since 2006 to now, Jefferson Parish as a whole, we've elevated more than 2,000 houses. A lot of these houses met certain definitions that FEMA is looking for, and then we really tapped into grants that for a long time, most other communities in the nation weren't, weren't accepting. You look at a list of properties and FEMA says, oh, if you meet this repetitive loss threshold, two or more claims, or then severe repetitive loss, four or more claims, at one point in time, Jefferson was number one in the nation for that, Jefferson Parish. We don't want to be number one on that list. And so how do we really attack this? So my apologies to our new director. We can reshoot that uh, introduction scene if you like. So we thought this was an appropriate uh, audience to screen this at. Obviously, so much of Jefferson Parish is in the Parish area. Um, area. Um, and we just thought this was like a very easy tough medium to um, display and communicate a lot of topics and information that is important to us, but um, as you saw also nationally, um, obviously the topics covered here are new to you all, but we certainly encourage you all to um, take advantage of, of this film, um, discuss it within your, your communities, show it to your, your constituencies, your, your local leaders. Uh, there's a, a full version on the Jefferson Parish YouTube channel. Uh, just search for the film title, Unintended Consequences. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take any questions or if there's any discussion. Yes. Uh, no, but I will certainly make a note of that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you. You are. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Matt Benoit and actually Lamb Yacht to come on up and uh, tell us a little bit about the big push off plan that they just finished doing. Uh, it's just going to be me up here today. Let's see if I can rearrange this presentation. All right, so I'm Matt I'm on the Habitat Restoration Manager for the Fair Territory Wildlife Statutory Program. Uh, here to talk to you about um, the plan we did for one of our managing, management conference members, the Fair Police Report Commission. Uh, actually, we went beyond uh, Brian and all the members of our uh, nursery team uh, did this planning over the last uh, four months or so. But it's a 36 acre uh, market planning. Um, and in Fort it's, uh, we did a series of 11 plantings uh, from March, March to the last month. We had uh, 76 volunteers come out and help us plant a base of about 146 plants. So here's kind of the orientation map of the area. You see me do up at the top. And uh, of course, here's Fort Bouchon, Grand Island, be off over here. We got by Bouchon coming down LA LA1. So this is the area of the March creation right here. Uh, and then here is the uh, Harrison Forest Ridge that uh, we've partnered and worked with uh, the port and many members over a couple of years. So we've been working with the port for uh, well over two decades, uh, uh, kind of restoring this area here. So not that long ago, in uh, 1998, uh, in this visual, you can see that the port was pretty small uh, footprint at that time, but uh, had a lot of open water out here, a lot of degraded marsh, a lot of uh, talk about subsidence, this is an interior marsh that subsided. Um, over the years that the port expanded, uh, they would uh, build these slips for the, um, the deep water um, ships, and then this material could uh, do marsh creation projects. So here you got marsh creation project here, this is 2005, we got the first 2,000 feet of the uh, maritime forest ridge built. Uh, with the footprint for the next 3,000 years. Um, 
And then in 2012, uh, we got the bridge finished by this time. Now more um, more expansion here, some more sediment moved into this area. And now we've got protection for the ridge on the north side of the marsh creation. Of course, this is still open water here. And then this is the latest entry I can find. Uh, February 22, um, from Google Earth. And now uh, the marsh has been created uh, in this section. Here's closer up here. So this is the 36 acre portion of the marsh. Uh, and then this is a, a contained area that uh, basically takes the uh, dewatering uh, extra materials and holds it for banking for future marsh creation. So basically in the past, a long time ago, they used to just kind of make a containment uh, dike levy here and let it deep water. And then the uh, sediment just kind of goes out to the bay, kind of gets lost. Uh, here you can kind of save it and so you're saving a lot of uh, sediment for your future creation. Uh, down here is the uh, Blue Ridge project that we worked on many years. So this was a uh, navigation um, dredging uh, here in Bayou Bush. It was a Navarro area. The second one was uh, dredged, uh, put through a discard pipe, uh, rehabilitation canal, over the marsh, over the bridge, the ridge, and then over the new marsh on this side and into the 36 acre uh, new area. So actually, now I went, uh, started doing some site surveys back in November and January, just trying to see uh, what we're getting into. Uh, 36 acres is a lot uh, of area to plant. And um, so we're just trying to get a lay of the land, see uh, the logistics of trying to get uh, 18,000 plants out over this 36 acre area. You can see uh, that's a little bit of volunteer vegetation here of uh, California. Uh, do have some little small little ponds here with some uh, uh, smooth foregrounds, but uh, a lot of barren areas, uh, even uh, two years post construction. So basically, we're out here to try to um, get grasses in here and, and uh, keep the make this a functioning marsh. Um, just some more pictures here. Some more uh, you guys do have a little bit of uh, mangrove here. Everything's lagging way behind. So uh, one of the things that we did in order to um, plant this area is just to see what's growing there and see what target species are growing there. So here's one of the species that we like to work with is actually a shrub. Uh, uh, salt macaroni vine, uh, Christmas berry, it's got a lot of wolf berry, it's got a lot of snakes for it, but it's in the tomato family. Uh, it's got a little red tomatoes that you can eat or mammal seeds and bird seeds. Uh, so we're just uh, trying to, we actually took GPS uh, points on uh, these plants, see what elevations they're growing at. Here's some of the stick with some soft grass. Uh, just see what's out there, make sure our target species are out there. Uh, then using some uh, data that the uh, Fair Food Support Commission gave us from the um, contractors, we have some elevation data. So that was useful in uh, figuring out where the low marsh is, where the low marsh plants, and then uh, where we put the uh, high marsh in these little polygons here. So the pink is the polygons to the high marsh. So basically these uh, pink is a uh, two foot um, or greater elevation, the yellow is one to two feet, and then the uh, blue is below a foot. So uh, basically these are the high points of the, uh, the area. So with this data, um, then we could uh, map out what uh, the sweet plants we'd use and how many we're going to use for it. So basically, all these six polygons here, the high marsh ended up being about seven and a half acres, and then we had 28, uh, little 28 acres of those lower marsh areas. So designing for the uh, the low marsh planting, uh, basically we decided to put a, a, a grid uh, going out here. So this is a north south kind of um, artificial line here uh, that we put uh, on 300 foot centers. Basically, we're going to put the um, Bamboo put the poles out here. They don't know every every 300 feet, so we kind of have a, a grid pattern that we could uh, decide where the plants go. Of course, we also put um, define our um, exterior boundaries. We put these on 60 foot uh, centers, and then of course we came back in and did 60 foot center down to the uh, north south axis, and then and then through uh, all our quadrants. So as I said, um, 
We brought up these uh, bamboos, put some uh, flagging tape on them. And basically, this became um, here we are, um, kind of going in and some mud here. Basically, it allows us to um, have a visual um, sight line for us to do the plan. So, in the lower marsh areas, we're planning on 15 foot centers. Uh, and we're using volunteer uh, to come out and help us with these planning. So it's very hard for a volunteer or anybody to actually go out and um, you know make a straight line uh, uh, when you're walking across about 2,000 feet of marsh. You've got a little pond that you have to walk around and all that stuff. So I have these visual representations. Volunteers to start at one of the um, bamboo poles and then uh, walk out uh, every 15 feet and put a plant in. And so you have this sight line and they get out. See where they're going. So here's uh, 300 feet, and then it's kind of hard to see, but they can still see it. We have them working uh, teams of two: uh, one person on the depth bar, and then one person uh, with plants. It's a lot of uh, equipment to do with one person. It's also pretty hard to um, keep on a straight line when you, when you put your head down and you are coming back up the plant and, and to re get your sight. But it's important to have this kind of grid. Otherwise, what you end up doing is you have a bunch of uh, lines. Um, you know, they're supposed to be on 15 foot centers, but it's, it's impossible. And so they'll move off, and then the other team will move off, and then they'll be five feet, and then they'll be 20 feet off the other. Another thing, too, is that uh, you lose track of how many plants you're kind of putting in, and then you end up putting 100% um, of your plants in the top 80% if you got kind of left over to the bottom. So it's a way to manage the plant. So, so in this, uh, in this example, we have uh, one team of uh, uh, volunteers take off on this um, sight line where they have the uh, bamboo to go off, and we have another going down through here. Then the next group could come through and working off the sight lines, the plants, they decide on this plant in between the, um, the 60 foot area there. And then, of course, as I said, it's on 15 foot centers, and so then they can come back and look at the plants they decide on just go right down the middle. So it's a good way to keep uh, keep the people and the plants for out. So here's an example of that. Um, so this line's already been done here. You can see it by the, the feet, footprints, and of course the plants right here go here, and then they're just uh, going down right through the middle of that. Uh, working with the double farm plant plant. Of course, here's the smooth core grass, so which you can in for the dumb species and salt marsh. And then uh, not all of it was kind of dry like that. We did have some little ponding areas on the um, south side that did have some um, volunteer vegetation that already came in, which looked pretty good. And here we are just kind of filling it with that ponding area. So that was uh, that was for all this interior spot. But of course, with every um, marsh creation project, you're you're building a, a containment levee in order to pump the sediment into. And then, of course, it dewaters out. But at the end of the project, you want to get rid of the uh, containment levy so it can operate as a uh, functioning marsh and have the ingress and ingress of tidal uh, waters. So once this is removed, though, then you're allowing uh, wave energy from by, uh, the bay area here to start eroding your, your project area. So you want to get that uh, well armored with plants as soon as possible. So instead of 15 foot centers here, Coraline Army uh, usually is in two and a half foot centers, and uh, in this case, for two rows and then uh, a five foot row behind it, five foot center row behind it. So, here we had some volunteers come out and loop. Uh, here you can see the back, or you probably can, but it's there. Back uh, five foot center row, and then the two and a half foot center row here, and then there'll be another two and a half foot center row here. Of course, we're just following contours. What's out there, it's never going to be a straight line. Um, and here, of course, working as um, the teams putting in the uh, smooth core grass. And here, later on, you know, it's an intertidal uh, marsh area. This is at high tide, so you can see um, uh, it, it inundated here. And, and one of the reasons it's very important to get this um, planted is that, uh, as you can see, the waters here, you can see the uh, Waves forming here. I mean, it's really that many today, but uh, once this gets, you know, three, four, five feet, then you're going to be stopping all this wave energy that's going into here. 
So then we moved on to the high marsh uh, planting. So we had uh, six polygons here. Um, we ended up, uh, so that's different plants, you know, low marsh, uh, it's a smooth core grass, it likes to uh, have its feet wet. Uh, these other plants uh, like it too, but they don't like it as much, so they're at a little higher elevation. So the four species that we um, used in this project are marsh hay core grass, these sort of path salem, salt grass, and uh, and the salt line tree line, these are feeding pervasion, and this being the uh, fish up. So all salt tolerant, all, uh, as I said before, uh, pre existing in this area, although in, in very few numbers. So I go back up. So basically, using that elevation data, I came, uh, I made up these polygons, uh, you know, on Google Earth with the GPS points. And then once we got out in the at the site, we took our GPS units and then uh, put these um, markers, these PPC markers, down uh, to find the boundary source of polygons. And then here, after that um, happens, uh, then prior to the volunteers come in, we're going to mark out the location. So uh, unlike smooth core grass, which grows very fast, rapidly, um, these other plants kind of grow a lot slower. So these are in five foot centers. And so that's what these tapes are here. We have actually have multiple tapes that are going along that allow us to move the um, tape over five feet at a time. And then put these 10 flags in at the five feet. So the volunteers will have um, nowhere to plant the plants once they come. Of course, that worked great for that little sandy area, but then here where the uh, sediment pipe um, the terminus was, yeah, as uh, the film we said, saw earlier, the velocity flows down. And then these heavy materials fall out. So you get these big shell mounds here. Ten flags aren't going in here. Um, and so we changed to uh, the paint and markings. Uh, same deal, though, at five feet. So you can kind of see those out here. Uh, we weren't the only ones out there at the time, though. We did have some uh, birds nesting in the area. They weren't too happy with our presence. Uh, but we did do some marking of um, the nests as we saw them. Uh, so when the volunteers came out, they would be uh, trauma through them. They're pretty far to see, so you get right up on them. Of course, we were very conscious at the time. When we were really far, and the volunteers would probably be somebody because they're occupied and planting. Uh, logistics were moving 18,000 plants out to the site. Uh, it's a big deal. Um, of course, we're coming from our uh, facility in Pivot at Nick State University Farm. Uh, we brought Half or supplied about half the plants to this project, and we bought the other from the grower in the rows. So here we are. We do have a uh, some boats. We do have a, a four wheel that we can get on the ramps. It helps us uh, get the plants out on the, uh, the project site. Uh, here we are with some smooth core grass from the uh, the grower we bought from the rows. And again, four wheeler in. We've got some uh, smooth core grass. We've got some uh, plant on the and here again, this is called my We also have some jet left to the grain um, in order to do the plants. Of course, all that has happened the day prior or early in the morning before the volunteers show up. So, when the volunteers show up, we can, um, you know, give them safety talk, give them an orientation, and tell them why we're doing the planning, and then we bring them out to the site. Uh, we did have two boats that we used along with the four wheeler. And here we are with jet sled, jet sled, uh, putting them in, and uh, grab the material up the site, and then just walk them on. So here's uh, one of our earliest plans, or I guess our earliest planning back in March, uh, in that first site with 10 flags. And uh, of course, we have uh, Brian here and have uh, on the gas drills, uh, drilling the holes, and then uh, other volunteers come behind and plan. Uh, here we are just. Uh, these two tapes in this site, uh, plant them on every five feet. So here is actually, uh, of course, when volunteers get there, they need to be um, schooled on how to plant, and I'm just giving them a talk on uh, proper techniques for planting the plants. And uh, of course, we have four different species that we're putting out there, um, and so we're looking to get them dispersed alongside. We don't want you know uh, all 50 of them all on this one side. So we uh, we. Uh, this person uh, across the site. This is the uh, SLB team out of this, our Mr. Uh, doing planning with us. 
Working drills, big plants. Here we go, I got nets here that we marked out so they can step on. And then, of course, uh, police uh, brought out a bunch of uh, Nickel State University uh, unit uh, students to come out and help us one time. I think there's a couple of uh, LSU students in here too. And uh, as the dates uh, went by, it got uh, pretty hot out there. Um, started bringing tents out there to heat. Of course, always you have Gatorade and you have waters for everyone. We are pet plants and patients. Uh, you get different um, conditions here. I've uh, got big rain, so this made a big soup mess. Uh, here's a uh, one of the uh, seashore patch beds that we throw out at the farm. Uh, there's a nice root mass there. And then this is uh, so this is that first site with 10 flags that was planted back in March. And there's just some March day cord grass that's uh, doing rather well. I mean, certainly I'm just showing you all the good fish because there's plenty of dead ones out there too. <laughs> but uh, that's just the nature of the beast. But uh, uh, seashore patch bed on here. And then even some of the ones that do die, like this uh, good core grass, uh, some of them come up and are starting to pop back up a lot. Uh, no shortage of uh, problems out there, though. Uh, we did have some storms come through, ruin our tents. Um, then we did have some problems with some uh, unmooring of the boat, had some heavy winds out there, and then, uh, you know, we're over uh, marking the, the site. And um, you look back over and it's not where it's supposed to be. So, okay. luckily, I caught this in the door, went all the way over there. Um, I'm going to have to get us my chest to get it that time. And then the opposite can happen too. Uh, even this <laughs> super high tide that day, but we knew it was going to, uh, you know, go down, go down rapidly. So, we're going over there like every 30, 45 minutes, moving out, moving out, moving out until you get busy and you forget about it. And it just takes about a third of the boat. And you can't move it by the time. So, luckily, the uh, port's real close by. Robbie came out and um, and picked us up, not without um, a good bit of ribbing. And um, but, uh, we did have our other boat, and so we just left the boat there. The next morning, he tied us back up. Uh, we just like our boat. But because of this, now we have some shallow water anchors for our boat, which makes uh, more of the boat uh, much easier now. So, um, we're not going to be losing any more. But that's the planning you did for uh, very quick port dimension. So 18,000 plants, so 11 plantings, and over 76 volunteers. Yes. My question uh, on the, uh, the elevated areas are where the, the shell typically is popping and it sits and makes it a little higher before the dredge contractor to move. But those areas, basically turn into natural nesting areas. Is it shorebirds that use them because of the shells that are there? Well, we got some people uh, out here that can answer that better. Maybe. Yes, absolutely. So different birds uh, are utilized in those areas. But yeah, I mean, as you saw, some of those tidal areas, the lower marsh, they're not they're not putting their nests in there. Otherwise. In fact, we did see some, I guess, guess work for them too. Sometimes we do see some eggs that walk around and you know, have super tide. And it's even beyond what they uh, instinctively thought. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of birds out there, not ominous, and then you know, you're not happy, but we try to get out of sight so we good. Any other questions for Matt? Okay, thanks, Matt. That was great. All right, I'd like to remind everybody of our next management conference will be November 7th. And like Graham said earlier in this meeting, um, there's a chance it may not be on campus, but rather somewhere else with an estuary. We're going to maybe try to bring the management conference to the estuary instead of always having it in the same spot. So please pay attention to the location um, when you leave that morning to go to the meeting. We've got some upcoming fitness events. I'm going to talk about those, though, under other business. And uh, I'll remind everybody that Emily Baldwin has been doing an incredible job of keeping us updated with what's going on at BitNet through our estuary updates newsletter. If you want to submit something that your group, as part of the management conference, is doing, any event that would be relevant to our organization, um, please submit it to info at bitnet.org by the 25th of the preceding month. So if you get it to us by the 25th of 
August, it'll be in September newsletter. Okay, so these are all events um, that your organization may be having that would be relevant to uh, the whole Bitcoin organization. All right, on Saturday, September 14th from 8 to 12, uh, BitNet will be giving away native plants. So we heard a little while ago about the importance of native plants in your backyard, so it'd be a great opportunity for you to pick them up. They'll have pollinator plants available as well as large native shrubs and trees, and this will be happening at the BitNet Native Plant Nursery, which is located on the Nichols Farm. Uh, the address is 104 Thoroughbred Drive. All this information is here on your, on your agenda. Um, on September 21st, on that Saturday, BitDev is collaborating with Nichols and Louisiana Department of Life Fisheries to participate in International Cocoa Cleanup Day. And they will be doing a beach sweep at Elmer's Island Wildlife Refuge. So we're looking for volunteers for that. Um, it's a morning event. And the International Coastal Cleanup, what happens is we collect data on the trash that is picked up. Dr. Elise Farrar collects that data. She, and then she compiles it all and uploads it to the Nature Conservancy. Oh, not the Nature Conservancy. The Ocean Conservancy. The Ocean Conservancy web page. And so the data and the trash that we collect is put into with a worldwide uh, data collection. So it's kind of neat that our little park out here, South Louisiana, is part of this worldwide effort. And it's a really great day. It's usually nice out. It's late September, so it's not as hot as it is now. And I really encourage everybody to try to uh, go up for that one. I'll be here on the floor talking about the white food gala coming up on Tuesday, September 24th. That's far in the almonds. The food has always been fantastic. Um, you know, good friendship. It, it always sells out. And so if you want your ticket, tickets are available right now. So please see the cold app if you'd like to, to get your ticket before they sell out. And then coming up Saturday, October 12th, uh, BitNet is hosting their Paddle by Lafouche. And registration is open. And just go ahead and please contact the BitNet office for, for more information. I think they're going to um, end right here in front of campus. And there will be maybe some food. And I know there's going to be a location band plan. So um, it'll, be, it'll be a good time. Come on out and join us. Any other business? Yeah, we'll move on to new business. And uh, there's a, I think everybody knows about the little white of oil spill. And I would like to ask Dustin Riley to give us a little bit of an update. All right, Ben. When, um, once again, my name is Dustin Ravelli. I'm the executive director for the Bayou Food Freshwater District. And unfortunately, for the second time this year, uh, I'm, I'm up here explaining you know, some kind of disaster situation the Bayou is facing. Um, but I was asked to, to give some kind of update or, or brief talk on the law spell, and I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, first off, I'm going to tell you that, that you people know everything I do. I'm not. Um, Later on, I'll get to some commonly asked questions, but the, the number one question I get asked is, hey, what's really happening out there? Well, to find out what's really happening, you need only look at the press releases uh, coming from the Food Power Governments, um, uh, releases that they release. I'm, I could talk for hours about this situation, but I, I will say this. Um, every decision that I've been, you know, witness being made or whatever the case has been made as part of a team, as part of an effort. No government entity nor business has ever been shut down or their idea not vetted or heard out. Uh, so I don't really have anything to tell you that, that is, is going to blow you away. But what I, I would like to, to point out is kind of a local response uh, as I've seen it through my eyes. Okay. Uh, July 27th, Saturday, at around 7.50, the, the initial 911 call came in. And from there, they, they alerted the Sheriff's Office, the Foosh, uh EOC, Freshwater District, EQ, so on and so forth. All right. By noon of that same day, I want to explain to you know, just some of the things that had already taken place. Just four hours later, there had been a command center established the spill was contained, and actually, the I would argue uh, the 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 main containment point from that moment on, really through the end of this. Well, I don't want to say the end of it, but really through the last few days, has remained in place. There have been some uh, secondary containment placed at further downstream, like uh, machines or what have you, but it was it was more or less contained. 
very early on. Uh, that we felt confident in that containment that that would hold. That's extremely important because the, the district's number one legislative charge, we have several, but our number one legislative charge is to make sure that the water districts all throughout Bayou Pooch have a fresh source of water to draw from to treat. Okay. Uh, the spill source had been, had been ID and secured. And any equipment that was required for the response uh, was either on site or in route or if it had been called up. I'm not going to say whether I think that's fast, slow, or whatever. You can make your own interpretation about that. One of the things that we had decided early on that, that Saturday morning was that the, the facts, the figures, the news, the press releases would, would only come out of one source. And I'm still going to honor that because I think it's been and it's working very, very well from what I can, can tell. So in terms of uh, how many, you know, oiled animals, I think they got about four or five turtles yesterday. How many gallons or barrels, whatever you want to know, I would just reference you to uh, that Facebook page. Um, in terms of the future, uh, in the short term, I think you're probably seeing now some of that initial response being scaled back. There's just not copious amounts of all to still collect. Uh, in the long term, it's going to move, move more to management. Uh, I would imagine some form of what you would envision, some kind of you see something, someone's there to respond to it. Um, and, and then as far as that, I don't know, I think the storybook is still written. Um, yes, it is true. And, and Archie said that at the first press conference, this is the, the worst oil spill the body has seen. I do want to run through a couple of commonly asked questions I, uh, I receive on a day-to-day -day basis. Did the district stop or slow the flow of water? And you may know we, we placed that water by Lafouche and Dobsonville. So the answer to that is yes, we actually did. The morning of, while I was on my way to that, I started getting more and more phone calls. And you can say it's a fog of war or whatever. I, I just simply say it, it, not knowing what was going on, the, we did temporarily scale down about 25% uh, of what we normally place in the body. However, by the end of the day, that was fully restored. Uh, was the parish ever in danger of running out of um, a fresh water drinking source? I would say no, it, it was not in danger, okay? Uh, early on, one of the first things that was, was accomplished was putting some emergency or secondary uh, containment around the Flush Parish Water District 1's intake. Uh, that was approximately about two and a half miles further south of where the primary containment uh, had ended. But I don't think there was ever any danger of that. They did once or twice shut down. Uh, out of just an overabundance of caution, but in talking to Wayne, nothing ever got at those end takes. Nothing of substance, that's for sure. Um, hey, Doug, I saw some pictures of some dead oil, oil, dead oil and ball, king crab uh, in the body. We got that in the body. No, we do not have king crab <laughs> flowing through the body. I, I am aware of the picture that they are referencing. Um, one, the crabs get there, all crabs get there when you dump them in the bayou. And secondly, the day we have king crab flowing through the bayou, we're probably going to have bigger worries than an oil spill. Um, and why, another question was why we don't just close the Blackport gate, just contain it, there would be no need for a rush or anything of that nature. Well, that was considered. And actually, that day till about four o'clock, we uh, we had the freshwater district had a crew on that gate ready to deploy it if needed. But that doesn't come without consequences. Uh, if I would have closed that gate at that moment in time, I would have raised the elevation of the bayou, exposing more land that had not seen any oil to additional oil. Um, and it causes a slew of other things uh, to occur. But like I said, that decision was made 
uh, as a team, and um, I think it was the right decision for the faculty um, With that, that's like I said, really more or less all I have. I, I don't. Uh, I, I think so far when you look at the response at the federal, state, and local level, um, personally, I think it's been phenomenal. I mean, on a Saturday morning. I was literally laying in my bed and watching the news to, to, to see if I need to get ready for a hurricane. And unknown to me, there was something else I needed to get ready for. But um, with that, I'll, I'll happily take any questions that I can. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, nobody called in and, and asked what the fines and penalties would be to the, the libel party? So how that's calculated, uh, I don't, I, I'm not the one to answer that process. There'll be plenty of time to worry about fines, penalties. The number one priority right now, from my eyes, is getting the situation remediated, things back to normal as quickly as possible. Yeah, I cannot I, emphasize I just thought that. somebody would call in that. Oh, oh, no, there's no doubt. Just go look at Facebook. There's already people called. You didn't I, 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 there was no mention of that. That's why. Yeah, I'm Yeah, there will be a time and place for that, but I don't, that's not certain enough for me to discuss that process. So I never went on scene and expected what PPE, any random member of that cleanup crew would have had. Um, I didn't go on site specifically for that, but I never saw anyone without uh, a life jacket, uh, steel toe boots, or things that you would commonly um, expect to see uh, as far as PPE on this type of scene. But I will say this too, the, the response company does have a safety officer. Every meeting uh, that was was conducted in the command center. The um, PPE and safety, certainly heat, has been a, a number one topic that that has been discussed for every meeting that I have been present. I think I'm going to draw another question. Yeah, Dustin. Um, first, I was very happy that this was not my problem, but your problem. It's a lot of people ask that question. Works. Yeah. But uh, when calamity, I got to avoid. I, my only question really is, how far would you say the main containment was downstream from where the water entered? Just roughly. The, the main yeah, so I actually checked it on my odometer because initially I had brought the Coast Guard. I was going to look at it, and the Coast Guard EPA just jumped in my truck, and they said, we can, can we tag along? And I'm like, sure. It was 3.1 miles okay. along LA-1. So it's a little, it's on my truck, so. Yeah. I didn't know exactly where it was. Thanks. And I'm referencing the main containment, Dwayne, when, you know, I think it was, uh, I'd have to go back and look at the log of 1015. Yes, well, the response company had showed up with boom and they were already placing it in the body. So that 3.1 miles, that was actually between behind Holly Marie's and that fall wash in front of Walmart. So it's located right about there. And that's what I'm referencing as the main containment. Thanks. All right, any other questions for Dustin? Okay, it's a comment. Hey, thank you for that, Dustin. I just wanted to add that um, it kind of related to one of the questions uh, earlier that um, last week we kind of discussed with the staff that, um, you know, as these events go on and that particularly as the, uh, the impacts are assessed and quantified and so forth, they tend to drag on just forever and ever. And one of the reasons for that is there's often um, a lack of or a shortage of potential projects to mitigate for those impacts. Well, we've got a ready-made organization, the Management Conference here, that has lots of good ideas about how to restore the bayou and do things to potentially mitigate for impacts. And so I know it's too early in the process really to even begin discussing that just yet, but we are involved in that, at least as a staff, a program staff. And for those that are here and involved, I just want to throw that out there that uh, when the time comes to uh, to implement projects that can mitigate some of the impacts associated with this event, we want to be there and be involved if we can. Thanks. That's an excellent point. And and I do want to uh, mention, look, I, um, you've seen your parish president uh, 
talking on uh, in reference to numerous times on TV, and Archie has just been great. He's um he's there before I get there in the morning, and he's there after I leave every day. Um, but I, I really wanted to highlight for everyone here, just you know, in, in government, but you catch a lot of flag sometimes, and you never really get a lot of compliments for things that you do right. Um, and you can form your own opinion about what you think that response is. But from from my vantage point, I, I cannot envision federal, state, or local entities working uh, more hand in hand than than what I was able to witness over the last week and a half, two weeks. All right, thanks. Any we got one more question? Maybe possibly the I'll obviously on you for it on the next site and. But once it comes to Archie, I don't think it would have turned out the way it did. And so I just wanted to publicly say that I'm going to hear it out to it. I mean, that's a huge thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You made my job a lot easier. All right. Thank you, Archie. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Bagel uh, to uh, speak to us about the upper EDES workshop. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is just to let folks know um, about a project that's uh, underway. Um, I wear a couple of different hats, and so this is through uh, my position at uh, LSU, uh, the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences. And it's working under a grant, uh, EIL grant, working with Andrew. Um, and it's uh, aimed at, uh, as the title says, it's the Upper Bay Ritary Terrebonne system. And we want to get an up to date picture of the status and trends of the watersheds and waterways in the Upper Estuary, uh, you know, in Point Capi, Iberville, West Baton Rouge, and St. James Parishes. So the project involves a series of Zoom workshops and then one in-person meeting. Um, and they're happening roughly about once a month. We have the first one and the second one is coming up next week on the 14th. Uh, we hit on 1 p.m. is a good time to hold them. Um, I'm happy to forward information. I think you're getting it through uh, the program, but um, We'll have one on the 14th, and the next one after that is on September 11th. So we're working with the uh, agencies, you know, the uh, parish folks, uh, state agencies, federal, uh, to talk about what's going on uh, in these waterways and in these watersheds. And they're open to anyone who's interested. We are reporting them. And the goal of the project is to come up with a body of information from these workshops it will be summarized in a report uh, along with the recorded uh, presentations. And that will be um, presented to the management conference uh, for uh, use uh, you know, in the plan uh, to be archived and made available for folks. So that's basically the idea. Um, it's to try to get some attention, see what's going on in some areas that hadn't gotten as much attention uh, in the past. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. And then, as I said, they're open to anyone who's interested, and we are recording them because uh, we know that people are busy and it's impossible to find a time when everyone can make a meeting. So um, we're trying to make them as accessible as we can. So, Doug, in, in addition to getting the updates from uh, the program office, is there another a website or something that we can find out? Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, there's a Facebook page. And it's Upper Barataria uh, Watershed uh, Education, I think, project is uh, what it's called. But uh, we can get you the information too. But if you, group, if you Google that, there is a Facebook page. That's where information will be posted. And we'll be sending it around, you know, the links to join the workshops if you're able to. Great, thank you. Any other questions? All right. All right, thank you. Thanks. Anybody else have any new business they'd like to share with the group? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm Justin Lemoyne. I'm the director of the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area Program for the state. I just wanted to let everybody know that Lapouche Parish um, 
has expressed interest as, as Nichols University in being included in the boundaries of the heritage area. We have a, a public meeting for the public to come out and ask questions and learn about the program and understand what it means to be added to the heritage area tonight from four to six at Raceland, um, or in Raceland. Um, it's on the uh, Lafourche Parish Government's website. Um, it's at the uh, Matthews Government Complex and the Council Chambers from four to six. Okay, we have an announcement. Yes. Hey, I'm Rebecca Trush with the Indiana Wildlife Federation. I wanted to say that we were excited to partner with the Tunis of the Lucky Tribe to produce a coveted book in the Tunis language. That was last year. And this year, the Lucky language. And the, um, it's a kit. It's about wildlife, native wildlife, noting that in, in their language. And it's a tool for them to teach their language, but also we added um, uh, a, a key pronunciation tool that you can also learn this language if you'd like to as well. And I bring this up in case it is inspirational to anyone here because it has also inspired uh, something similar in um, at the University of Nebraska for Spanish children. And when we were talking about this concept, we got the suggestion that we should put multiple languages in the book. Cajun and French is one of them, and um, Latin, I mean, it's a lot of suggestions. So it, it, it's a um, simple and delightful project to work on, but it has some inspiration in the book. And I'm happy to share that on the website as well. All right, thank you. Any other new business comments? Got two quick things to close out with. One is that we have lunch here today, so I hope you can stick around and enjoy uh, some lunch with us. And two, don't forget the white blue game of tickets are here for sale that you can pick that up now and uh, just be done with that. All right. Do we have uh, any more comments or a vote out? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Chris, motion to adjourn second. Baby, all right, all in favor? All right. Uh, no.